It's December 1998, and shares in upstart bookseller Amazon.com have taken off. Over the past year, they have risen from $50 to the mid-200s, and you'd be forgiven for thinking shares might need to take a breather. But one analyst at Oppenheimer absolutely rejects that line of thinking. Henry Blodgett issues a $400 price target, making headlines and leading one user of the Motley Fool message board to ask who at CNBC was smoking crack when they uttered that. Whether Henry Blodgett was on crack, we may never know. But Amazon reached $400 per share within weeks. Henry Blodgett's history provides little evidence for the fact that he had arrived at Oppenheimer thanks to anything besides privilege. He went to great schools, but he was a history major who then taught English in Japan, then tennis lessons in San Francisco. But none of that mattered after he'd made his bold and prescient call on Amazon. The internet had come to Wall Street, and Henry had proven that he understood it better than most. Merrill Lynch poached him away from Oppenheimer and installed him as senior research analyst covering the internet sector. At Merrill, Blodgett continued to be something of a hype man for the internet. There was a rating system established for stocks where one was the best and five was the worst, and he almost never gave anything a rating worse than two. This was a system that worked well until it didn't. The Nasdaq peaked in March of 2000, and soon billions of dollars had been lost much by people who had relied on his ratings and price targets. So you'd expect that maybe Blodgett lost his job and had a lot of people mad at him. But unfortunately, no, it was much worse than that for two reasons. First, there was an up-and-coming prosecutor in New York named Elliot Spitzer who had political ambitions. And second, Henry Blodgett was not just some dummy who was all in on internet euphoria. He knew that some of his buy recommendations were for garbage companies, but he published them anyway. Elliot Spitzer saw people in his district who had suffered huge losses. They wanted someone to blame other than themselves, and he decided to give that to them. That way he could portray himself as the guy who punished criminals even if they wore suits to work. A notable analyst would make the perfect villain, and Blodgett, unfortunately, fit the bill in both title and action. Spitzer acquired internal Merrill Lynch emails showing improper communications between the analyst and the investment banking division. See, at its most basic, banks can make a ton of money working for large public companies, but first they have to win their business, and they're less likely to choose a bank to work with if there's an analyst there who's saying bad things about them. Of course, That's sort of just how the game is played, even today. Listen to the resigned language in this Investopedia article about whether you should trust stock analysts. While some of this activity still goes on, new regulatory and voluntary changes in the process have taken place, and there seems to be some improvement. Unfortunately, there will always be potential for conflict. So, was Blodgett just a scapegoat? Absolutely, but also there were those emails. It's sort of like the issue of performance enhancing drugs in sports. It's one thing for people to have a sense of what's happening, but it's different if the evidence is shoved in their face and, oh boy, listen to this. On December 4th, 2000, Blodgett emailed a fellow analyst about a company called LifeMinders that they had initiated coverage on, stating, LFMN at $4? I can't believe what a POS that thing is. Shame on me, us, for giving them any benefit of the doubt. Blodgett's next report on LFMN reiterated a 2-1 rating, meaning buy for the short term and strong buy for the long term. Then, regarding a company called Internet Capital Group, he wrote, No hopeful news to relate, I'm afraid. This has been a disaster. There is really no operations here to fall back on, so there really is no floor to the stock. We see nothing that will turn around near term. There's nothing positive to say. All the while, 
Blodgett's research report from a few weeks prior reiterated a 2-1 rating, just like for life minors. And finally, there's this email to Blodgett from a junior analyst laying out their dilemma. If 2-2 means that we're putting half of Merrill retail into this stock because they are out accumulating it, then I don't think that's the right thing to do. We are losing people money and I don't like it. John and Mary Smith are losing their retirement because we don't want GoTo's CFO to be mad at us. Credit to whoever that was, though, because in that case, at least, he got the rating pushed to 3-2. Suffice it to say, none of this really looks good for Blodgett, and in 2003, he settles with the SEC. He is barred from the securities industry for life and pays $4 million in fines. This isn't the beginning of the end for Harry Blodgett, though. It's just the end of the beginning. With no bridges to worry about burning and years of insider knowledge, Blodgett begins to reinvent himself as a financial news journalist, the person who's not afraid to tell the truth because they have nothing to lose. Pretty soon, he's working for Slate.com, which gives him the opportunity to meet now Governor Elliot Spitzer in the lunchroom. He reminds him that he ruined his life, to which Spitzer replies that he's just doing his job. This, of course, is incredible because flash forward a few more years and Reuters is reporting that former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer, who resigned earlier this year over his involvement in a prostitution ring, will write a column for online magazine Slate.com. Slate previously hired disgraced Wall Street analyst Henry Blodgett to write for it. Blodgett now runs Silicon Alley Insider, a widely read media business news blog. That's right. By 2008, it was Spitzer who was down and Blodgett who was up. Today, Silicon Alley Insider is better known as Business Insider and according to Alexa, is one of the most popular websites in the U.S. It even at one point received an investment from Jeff Bezos, marking a role reversal where now it was up to the Amazon chief executive to assign his own valuation to the company Blodgett founded. More recently, the majority of the company was purchased by Axel Springer SE at a valuation of over $400 million. So Blodgett is probably doing all right. I want to end with one more thing about Henry Blodgett, maybe the most important thing. In researching this piece, I'm convinced that not only was he punished for just doing what everyone else was doing, and still does, because he had a name that people recognized, I think had anyone listened to what he was saying in the 1990s beyond just buy or sell recommendations, they probably would have been better off than the average investor. In January 1999, Blodgett wrote in an Oppenheimer research report, Given the extent of the recent move, the current internet stock phenomenon clearly looks like a bubble, assuming bubble means enormous manic increases in price without corresponding changes in the fundamental outlook. So. We recommend that investors continue to limit exposure and actively manage risk. In October 1999, he said he believed three quarters of all existing U.S. internet companies would fail to make any money and that, quote, the spoils will go to the few and not the many, indicating that between seven and ten companies could end up dominating all areas of internet business. He continued, there are a ton of tulip bulbs out there. Finally, in April 2000, he said in a research report, for aggressive investors, we recommend allocating a small percentage of the overall portfolio in leading internet stocks. Henry Blodgett was no hero, to be sure, but he wasn't the villain he was made out to be either. Greed is the villain, because it made people listen to him when he said bye, but ignore him when he said be careful. 
Thanks for watching, guys.